We are going to read our word, uh, our scripture today from Galatians chapter 4, verse 21, all the way to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, I see some, some of you are still paging. <clears throat> but if you have found it, it reads like this. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad barren woman For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with us during this time as we are about to look into your word, Lord, and uh, as, we are, as I'm about to preach it, that you'd be with me. Help me, Lord, to uh, faithfully and clearly, without confusion, without, uh, without, without uh, confusing your people, but uh, in clarity and precision, help me, Lord, to speak your word. Help me, Lord, also to trust in you and not myself or my preparation or even my skills or anything that I, I might be lied to by the devil to think I can do. But help me trust you, dear Lord. I pray for your church here that is listening to your word, that, Lord, you would help them to receive your word, that, Lord, your, your spirit would carry the word deep into their hearts and, Lord, deep into their day-to-day -day lives, that, Lord, they would be changed, that they would live lives, O oh God, that give glory to you, dear Lord. We pray you be with us in this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I, have, uh, I, have, I have been watching a lot of interviews of, of people that are ex-prisoners. So in these interviews, they talk about their experiences in prison and this other one talks about what happens when you're about to leave prison. He says there's a card you have, and on it they will write the parole date, meaning you are going to be in a parole board, and they will look at how you've been doing in prison to see if you are worthy of parole. Parole is basically when you are serving the sentence, but a half of the sentence of, of the years you are supposed to serve in prison you are saving it, but you are outside. There's still restrictions, there's still a curfew, there's still all of that, but you are outside. You're not in, in, in chains anymore. So this ex-prisoner says, the, the, the parole board looks at things like whether or not you've been participating in rehabilitative uh, programs of the prison. 
whether you've been doing something positive, maybe you've been working in the prison garden, or you've been serving in the kitchen, or you have been uh, singing in the choir, or you're in the church in the prison, or you're even teaching some of the uh, students in prison, something like that. Something that shows that you have left the life of gangsterism, and also, most importantly, they want to make sure you have not been involved in fights and you, have, uh, you don't have any wounds or you have any health issues. Apparently, it's a bad reputation to the prison to release someone who's limping or someone who's coughing. And if they find that, who is that? The prison board. If they find that, then your prison, uh, you're, you're not getting parole. So, but another thing that interests me that he mentioned was the fact that your main responsibility is to hide your prison, uh, your, your, your parole board date on the card from the fellow prisoners. You have to make sure that they don't know that on this day you have parole. You are going to be uh, evaluated for parole. Why? Because prisoners hate to see other prisoners being set free. He says someone on those weeks leading to that will just come up to you and hit you. Others will just come to you and do something horrible just so you can get into a fight. Just so you can... Other, other, even people that are playing like sports, soccer, they're saying when their parole date is coming, they're not even going to play because they might get injured there and parole doesn't want people that are limping. But it was intriguing to, to see that prisoners, they hate to see other prisoners being liberated, going into freedom. And... Uh, I want to ask, what would you think of someone who is an ex-prisoner who has come into this life, into, into the outside, to live with us, to work with us? He is married, he has established himself, he's living a fruitful life. But what did you think of that person after many years if he says to himself, I want to go back to prison? To that life of no freedom, to that life of hundreds of regulations and just so much enmity and we are just everybody's enemy or on your own. It's, it's wild out there and it's just painful to live there. What would you think of someone who decides to go back there? Obviously we would think this person is crazy. He's not thinking straight. Or he's high on something. And unfortunately that is exactly what happened in this church of Galatia. This, this, this scripture that we are going to look at today, Paul talks to this church that has done exactly the same thing. So if we know what happened in the book of Acts, we know that Paul, after being converted, has, uh, has done all the many other things, but one of the things that happened is that he pastored a church called Antioch with a man called Barnabas. And then at some point, the church sends them off to their first missionary trip, and then in that first missionary trip, they visit this, church, uh, this cities where they preach the gospel. And some of these cities belong to this region called Galatia. Paul has labored hard to preach the gospel of grace to these people. And Christ has set them free. Christ has saved them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But there is people that came and preached the law to them. There's people that came from Jerusalem that came to preach that without being circumcised, without obeying the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. You cannot be acceptable before God. You cannot be a child of God. Now, Paul, Paul cannot believe how people like them who have so, so, uh, so strong foundations in the gospel how could they have allowed someone to bring them back into bondage? Because as he writes this letter, they have already allowed them to. Because we, we know a very famous verse in, in, in the previous chapter of chapter 4, which is chapter 3, verse 1. You know what Paul says to them? He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Because Paul cannot attribute this to anything else other than foolishness and, 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 and witchcraft. That you who understood the gospel, who accepted it by faith, how, how do you drop it all of a sudden and go to the law? To try and be acceptable to God based on the law. So our title of the sermon today is called Three Truths About Christian Liberty to Encourage Us. 
And we are dividing our sermon into three subtopics. The first one is the bondage. The second one is the freedom. The third one is the responsibility. Let's look at the first one, the bondage. We're going to read from verse 21 to verse 23. He says to them there, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? This is Paul saying to the church of Galatia, the churches of Galatia, because it's a region, there's a lot of churches in there. He's saying to them, you who want to be under the law, do you, are you aware? Did you truly understand the law? Are you aware of what you, what you want? Basically, are you aware of what the law says? He uses the, the, the word law twice there, but both times it means something different. The first usage of the law, when he says, you who want to be under the law, it means the system of requirements that a person who is under the law has to, has to accomplish them in order to be acceptable before God, in order to basically be saved. But the second usage of the law, when he says, are you aware, are you aware of what the law says? That usage of the law, he's talking about the Torah, meaning he's talking about the scriptures. Exactly there where they, the, the false teachers have went to make, to intimidate the, the, the Galatian Christians and say to them, you guys have been, uh, have, been, have, been, have been not doing it right. You need to come back to the Bible. You need to do it the biblical way. These false teachers who came with the law and said, you need to come back to this, Paul is saying, did you even understand the law? And now in verse 22, Paul continues to say, for it is written, basically he's now taking them through a Bible study. He's basically saying, you, back to the Bible kind of group, let's read the Bible together and let me show you where you missed it. So Paul is saying to them, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, and the other by the free woman. He's basically telling them about a famous story of a man called Abraham. Nobody doesn't know this man. This is the man that received the promises from God, the man whose faith was so exemplary that he was called a friend of God. He says, Abraham, I want us to picture this because he's drawing a picture here and he's going to draw them somewhere with the picture. And this picture is a picture of a real story that actually happened. He's saying Abraham had two sons. Now, he's saying one by the slave woman. Obviously, that son by the slave woman, is, his name is Ishmael. He says the other by the free woman, and his name we know is Isaac. Verse 23, his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born uh, as a result of a divine promise. He's basically saying this son by the slave woman, which is Ishmael, and that slave woman, which is Hagar, he was born according to the flesh. What he's talking about there is the fact that when Abraham had Ishmael, Abraham was, was sick and tired of waiting for the Lord. If you remember the story, Abraham was 75 years old when God called him from his home country to say, I will show you a country where you will live, and I'll give you a, a, a descendants and look at the stars, the this, this stars that you cannot number, this will be as many descendants as you. Abraham waited and waited and waited. And at the point when he decided to, ha to have Ishmael, Abraham was now 85 years old, living in this land, and God did not give him Isaac yet. So basically, Abraham took matters into his own hands. Abraham decided to help God. Abraham acted in disbelief. And that is why Ishmael is called the child born according to the flesh. So this is not saying, okay, Ishmael's process of birth was not, uh, was not, was not nine months of pregnancy followed by this and that, and Isaac's progress of birth was, he dropped from this. No! The process is the same. He's talking about the heart condition of Abraham during this time. He acted according to the flesh. And then he says, but the free woman, uh, yeah, but the son of the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. Who is this free woman? It's Sarah, Abraham's wife. 
And who is the son of the free woman? Is Isaac. Paul is saying to them, remember this family. Remember what happened to them. This is a real life thing that happened in the book of Genesis. But he's not saying it just for saying it. Paul is going to use it to illustrate an argument he's making to them. Let's continue. Verse 24. He says, these things are being taken figuratively. So now he's going to use a real life story of what happened with Abraham and his family. And he's going to take it as a figurative meaning to, to explain this law that they misunderstood by going back to the Bible. And obviously, this is not how we have to read the Bible. We know this, that when we are reading a part of Scripture, whether we are reading about David or Moses, if it's a historical narrative, it literally means what it says. It doesn't have some hidden meaning. David does not represent some idea that is currently going on when we watch the news, and then Goliath means another idea. The Bible basically gives you history. Paul is not trying to give us a Bible interpretation interpretation principle, Paul is basically inspired by the Holy Spirit using this to draw truth that they should already know, but applying them in the law that they are clearly not understanding. He's saying to them, they are supposed to be taken figuratively. These women represent two covenants. What is a covenant? A covenant is a formal agreement that binds two or more parties in a specified relationship. So he says these women, which is Hagar and Sarah, they represent two covenants, then he's, he's, going to, he's going to continue talking about that. So basically, they represent two covenants. Uh, these two covenants, they, they lead us in different ways of relating with God. The covenant from Hagar, well, the covenant represented by Hagar leads us in a certain type of relationship with God. The covenant represented by Sarah leads us to a certain relationship with God. So he continues in verse 24. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. So he's actually now defining the covenant that Hagar represents. He's saying this is that old covenant that was made in Mount Sinai when Moses gave the law to the people of Israel. He's saying that old covenant bears people who are just going to be slaves. That covenant was... Was, 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 was producing slavery amongst the Israelites. He's saying, this is Hagar. And then verse 25. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she's in slavery with her children. Now she's, she's comparing Hagar with something else now. He first said Hagar represents the old covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. Now he's saying Hagar represents the present city of Jerusalem. What he's talking about when he's talking about the present city of Jerusalem, he's talking about Judaism and the legalists of Judaism. The people of the law, the people who said we are the children of God only to realize that God came amongst them, yet they rejected him. He walked into the temple and they chased him out. They crucified him. But they were claiming, they were actually, they were claiming that they are the children of God, but they were actually enslaved to something else that was against God, which is this law that the Galatians are entertaining. That's where Paul is taking them. So Paul is basically asking them, remember that first question, you who want to be under the law, do you even understand what the law says? Paul is saying to them, if you understood what the law says, you would have known that the law brings slavery. And at this point, it's like asking them, this, this, this present city of Jerusalem and its slavery and, 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 and what it has done to the Lord, is that what you want? The enmity they have displayed against Christ and his church, is that what you want? Because they have done this, being faithful to this idol God of theirs who has put them under this law and they are serving that God and they are not serving the God of Scripture. He actually does call it like that because if you read uh, the same chapter where we are, earlier, he does mention that they have, the, the people of the law are serving an idol God. But he's basically asking them, don't you know that's all it is? Slavery? 
If you actually have went back to scripture and understood the Bible, don't you then understand that this is all slavery? How would you, foolish Galatians, be attracted to that? When Christ saved you for free by his grace when I preached to you. In their slavery, they are, they, they are not in peace. They do not love God. They are basically serving this set of standards and requirements but they never get them to the God of the requirements. It ends there. It ends with them trying to, to, to serve these laws and regulations, but they end up serving an idol God and not the God that they should lead them to. Because the law was given to us, brothers and sisters, as a mirror to see that we are not righteous. So that when the righteous God gives us free righteousness, we would all run to it. It's like a doctor giving all of us a diagnosis so that he can tell us that he has the cure. You would expect that everybody would run for the cure, but other people will still be like, ah, I go to the gym, I will cure myself by exercise. But you'll exercise for the rest of your life, you'll never get to the healing. That's what the law is doing. It promises you something it will never give you. You are enslaved to it to a point where you reject the God of the law. So they have no love for God. They, are they have enslaved themselves to a God who does not rejoice in forgiving. And that's not the God of, of the scriptures. Even from Exodus, we know that the Lord, who is abounding in mercy, who, who rejoices to forgive, who has long suffering. You remember when, 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 when God revealed himself to Moses, those, those uh, attributes he gave, they don't serve that type of a God. Who, do, who forgives? No, their God you either obey or you don't and he kills you. He punishes you. They are not free. They are living under the pressure of, 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 of the, the possibilities of death. And they are under that condemnation. They have enslaved to a God who is not loving. Because there is no other thing they expect from this God they serve except punishment. They know that the Mount Sinai covenant said to them, if you obey, these are the blessings. If you disobey, these are the, the punishments. But they know that their, their disobedience outweighs their obedience. So they are doomed. They know that. And they know that their God, whom they worship, is actually coming for them. That is why they are so passionate about doing this impossible thing that they actually want to come to these churches and preach this nonsense. The God that they are saving, I mean, the, the God that they are serving does not rejoice in saving. Does not rejoice to come to sinners and die for them. He's not the God that we know. He's a God that sits there and just rejoices in, in punishing them. And brothers and sisters, that, not, that is not Jesus. That's an idol. As I said, verse 8 and 9 of this chapter in chapter 4 tells you that they have been worshipping idols. Let me give you a picture so you can understand this. Let's say there's a, there's a family that has two four-year-old girls. And these four-year-old girls are not allowed to go play outside. They're not allowed to, 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 to play and have fun and, 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 and draw some things and dance and sing. They're not allowed to express their, their, their childhood in their home because they have this tyrant father who gave them lots and lots and lots and lots of rules. If they could be watching some cartoons and they're giggling and laughing and this man wakes up from the bedroom and he comes to the, to the living room, suddenly they're all freezing, they switch off the TV. Those girls are also given this exams that are written by metric students. Because their father is out here saying, I want to make my children smart. And he's making them write metric students, mathematics kind of question papers that they fail all the time and he rejoices in punishing them for the failure. That man is not a father. He's a monster. He's a tyrant. And people who live under the law, they have reduced God to that. They have basically said, God wants us to do this. When he shows up, they are living in fear. 
They are living in bondage. They are bound to the set of rules. They are never free. They don't have any love whatsoever between them and their father and also between one another. Because guess what? Sibling rivalry begins there. Because when the other one reaches for the fridge to get some cool drink during a time when they are not allowed to eat cool drink, the other one will wait for an opportunity to, to, to tell the father. Daddy, daddy, she did this when you, were not, when you were not there. Why? Because they also hate each other. They rejoice in seeing the other person being punished. Now, for us to come to God in this way, we are saying that's who God is. That's an insult to the character of the God of Scripture. Those who are under the law, they have enslaved themselves under this satanic God that nobody knows. Because when God gave the scripture, sorry, when God gave the law to Moses, he didn't even intend it to be used this way. But they have interpreted that and they have ran with it to a point where they murdered him. God, the very one they think they are worshipping. There is no joy. There is no peace. They are just zombies. They are basically some lifeless evil people that don't love anyone, don't love themselves, don't even love the, the very person they are saving. They are just there to tick a box. Once they show up, the, 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 their God shows up, then they make it look like they obey, but they know deep in their heart they hate their God. This is exactly what the Pharisees did. Jesus said they are so hypocritical, they come to the public, they are dressing this way, they are speaking this way, but inside they are like the blackest, darkest thing you've ever seen. Because that's, that's exactly what the law will do. And this is why it doesn't save anyone. Because God sees the hearts and the law doesn't fix the heart. It fixes the, the religious duties. It fixes the, the peer pressure from whatever your, your cultic group that you, you see and you live with. And you guys tell each other, we can do this. We can achieve the righteousness of God. But you know you can't. So Paul is like saying to them, do you want this life? Do you want to relate in this way with God? Because God will never have children that relate with him like that. For you to be under the law, it shows you are not a child of God. The law produces fearful, loveless, judgmental, and narcissistic people. People who want to micromanage other people. The law produces miserable people. There is no joy, there is no joy with the law. There's a man called Warren Wisby, he wrote this. He said, legalism does not mean the setting of spiritual standards. Basically saying, being a legalist, being this person who pursues the law, it does not basically mean you're attaining to some spiritual growth. He says, though, it means worshipping these standards and thinking we are spiritual because we obey them. Basically, these standards are not only a means to an end, they are also the end by themselves. That is all we achieve, that is all we have. He says, it also means judging other believers on the basis of these standards. That's being under the law. Paul looks at them and he says, you Galatians, you who says you have read the Bible, did you at least understand this part about the Bible, about the law? The very law that you have gullibly been swallowed by. Brothers and sisters, that's not God's will for the Galatians. That's not God's will for Benoni Bible Church. God does not want to enslave us. God does not want to produce amongst us fearful people. One of the things that Jesus has said a lot of times, even the, uh, uh, the Bible, these are some of the most famous verses, you would hear him say, fear not, for I am with you. People under the law, they are living in fear. Loveless people. We in the Christian church, we are not those loveless people. We are not supposed to be. This is not God's, God's will for us. Living under the law is living under the tyranny of a satanic God that the Bible knows nothing about. Because the God of Scripture is the God of freedom. That is why we go to our second point of the text, which is the freedom. We see this, uh, we see this from verse 26. He's contrasting what he has just said about the law and its slavery. He's saying to them, but the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. 
The contrast he's drawing there is with regards to Jerusalem. He's saying they are represented by the Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem that is on earth. That is what we see in the previous verse where he says, Hagar corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she's in slavery with her children. The first contrast is that, because here he's saying, but the Jerusalem that is above, he's talking about the heavenly city, where true children of God belong. The citizenship of those who have come to God in faith is in heaven. He's saying there, there's freedom, because that's the second uh, distinction he makes, the freedom. In the previous uh, verse, he said, she is in slavery with her children, but this side he says we are free. And another uh, uh, contrast he draws is with the, with the parents. He says, Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Now, she, she uses this uh, pronoun for she because she wants them to remember that the same illustration I made about Hagar being the mother of those who are to be slaves, you must remember now, I'm not even going to mention her name, but I'm talking about Sarah, who is our mother. And here, you, I want you to also see another distinction he makes. He said she and her children are slaves in the previous verse. Here he says she is our mother. Paul includes himself in the children of Sarah. He includes the church of Galatia in the children of Sarah. And guess what? You and I, if we are saved, if we have come to God in faith, trusting in the finished work of Jesus, we are also the children of Sarah. She who was not able to give birth, God gives her now this offspring through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is why the next verse literally says, uh, this is verse 27. It says, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now Paul is, 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 is telling them about this religious system in the present Jerusalem. He's contrasting it with the religious system of those who are based in the heavenly Jerusalem. And now she comes to this uh, contrast with the mothers. He, has, he says, Sarah is our mother. And he continues to quote a verse that comes from Isaiah chapter uh, 54, verse 1, where it says this Sarah must rejoice because now God is giving her many more children than women that had means of giving birth. That's what it means to say more are the children of the desolate woman than her who is a husband. Sarah, who had no means, who had a dead womb. It's, 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 it's even understandable to say a woman that has been given birth has now gotten older. Now her womb is not capable of giving birth anymore. But with Sarah, it's even worse because she has never been able to give birth even when she was fresh. Now, how much less is she able to in her old age? But we know that in the real story, God gives her Isaac. Not because Sarah's womb is, 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 is all right, but because God literally brings it back to life by his miraculous power. This man also, Abraham, at his hundredth year of age, he also does not, his, 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 his seed making factory is also closed. He's shut down. He doesn't have a seed anymore. He's an old man. But God also had to go there and do something miraculous for Isaac to come so that both Sarah and Abraham will understand that Isaac is God's child, not ours. That is why Paul is saying that we are also children of Sarah because we come by the miraculous power of God. We don't come by the flesh. Unlike Ishmael, remember what it said about him? He was born according to the flesh. We don't come to God by the flesh. God miraculously makes us his children. And we receive that gift by faith. But I want us to talk about where he's quoting this from. Because he's quoting this, he's quoting this from Isaiah chapter 54. Do you know what Isaiah chapter 54 comes after? It comes after Isaiah chapter 53. Do you know what Isaiah chapter 53 is talking about? It's talking about Jesus' death on the cross. It describes this pain that the suffering servant of God who comes down to die for the sin of sinners. And 
and, and what he goes through, his life, and those who have rejected him, and, 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 and him going to the cross, dying amongst sinners, and then, remember the, the, the chapters and verse separation wasn't there when Isaiah wrote this. So the way you have to see this is that after, immediately after Isaiah chapter 53, as you are reading this sad story and details, you have to get to Isaiah chapter 54 verse 1, where these words come from. And there God is saying to this woman that he, that he has promised children too. He's saying to her, rejoice, O barren woman. As if to link it with the cross of Christ to say, this is exactly how I'm fulfilling my promise to you, Sarah. With this suffering servant that is, that is dying on the cross, you are to rejoice. And it's beautiful if you go to read Isaiah chapter 53, everything in there, almost everything, it is written in the past tense. Some of the, some of the verses are like, Christ was bruised for our transgressions and sins. They despised him. They rejected him. He was killed. It, picks, it speaks about it in past tense. But when it comes to this chapter uh, 54, verse 1, it speaks in the present. It says, you women. It doesn't say you rejoiced. It says rejoice. As if to say this is a present continuous tense. Heaven continues to rejoice because of that once for all sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Because that is when the promise of God that he made on Sarah was fulfilled. Through Jesus' cross, we have been born into the kingdom of God. We receive it by faith. We don't cause it. It had happened. We receive it by faith. That's what happened during our timeline. But on that cross, all sinners that have ever, I mean, all sinners that have ever lived, that will be in heaven, on that day when Christ died, he redeemed them. All that lived before the cross, all that lived after the cross, if they put faith in God and come and came to God, not by the means of their flesh, not by the means of their obedience, not by the means of their excellence in ticking those boxes of the requirements of the law, but they came because God himself is a savior and they trust in him. Jesus Christ was their flight into heaven. Jesus Christ's death. Amen. So, we know also Jesus said this in his own ways in, in Luke chapter 15 verse 7. When he was giving this, I'm not going to make you page there, but I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. He gave a parable about a lost sheep. He said a good farmer would leave the 99 sheep to go fetch this one. And he'll bring it home. But you know what he was saying there? Because his final words he says there, he says, Therefore, there is more joy in heaven when one sinner repents. More joy than 99 sinners that need no repentance. Basically, it shows that that present continuous tense of Isaiah 54 still continues. Heaven continues to rejoice when you and I step into faith and come into the kingdom of God. That barren woman that everybody laughed at, that God looked at in compassion and said, you will be the mother of nations. She continues to rejoice. And the rejoicing is present continuous because it never ends. We will be in heaven one day. We will continue to rejoice because of the finished work of Christ on our behalf. Nobody will rejoice because they obeyed. Nobody will rejoice because they have, they have ticked the boxes. Nobody will rejoice because they have lived a life that was good in the eyes of those in, in, in his or her group who were micromanaging his life, who were policing his movements. Because that is what legalism brings. It brings slavery. You are saving an idol. So let's continue. I don't want to run out of time. So basically, verse 28 and 29 continues this argument. He says to them, Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. He's giving them their real identity. He doesn't want them to, stay, to remain confused. The difference I'm making here, Paul says, the difference I'm making here, you have to know you don't belong to the negative side. You belong this side. You have to know who you are. You, like Isaac, are the children of promise. You are the ones that were born by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. This is why he says in verse 29, At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. He's taking, back, he's taking them back to the story. We know in Genesis chapter 21, verse 9, what was happening there is that Isaac, the child that was finally born to, 
Abraham by the promise and the fulfillment and the faithfulness of God, this child was now being weaned of breast milk. So Abraham threw a party for this young man, but this Ishmael, who by this time is a teenager, was mocking the man. I mean, the boy was, was mocking the child, was making fun of him. He hated the guts of Isaac. And then if you read chapter 25, verse 18, the Bible in Genesis also tells you there that Ishmael's descendants continued to be in, in enmity with Isaac's descendants. Now Paul here in verse 29 says to them, the child that was born according, born according to the flesh has persecuted the son born according to the promise, according to the power of the Spirit of God. And he says it is so even now. It still continues. Paul doesn't want them to confuse these things. When these legalistic Jews come from Jerusalem and infiltrate the Galatian region and bring this gospel of law, which in, in, in chapter 1 of Galatians, Paul says it is not even a gospel. He says even if anyone, us or any angel from heaven, brings a law that is contrary to the law that you have received, let them be accursed. Paul, remain, Paul, Paul leaves no mercy for these people because he knows their only destination is hell. That is where they belong because what they are doing, they are fighting against the very Son of God, Jesus, because he and he alone said, I will build my church and they come and destroy it. So he's saying, don't look at this and say they love us. This is love. This is an enlightenment error. They are coming to us and saying, you have been lost. We are regaining you to the truth. No, they are persecuting you. This is hatred. This is the rivalry that existed long before. They cannot stand to see the children of promise being loved by their father. Because to them, God is not a father. To them, God is this tyrannic monster who, who is bloodthirsty, who loves when people are crying, who loves when, 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 when they are carrying this heavy burden and trying to climb this mountain with it, and they keep tripling and falling back because this burden is too heavy for them. He's laughing. That's who their God, the one they worship is. Not the God of the Spirit who says, I will do it. You just receive it by faith. So Paul wants them to know that these people and us are different. The Judaic legalists have persecuted the church since day one. We know the death of, of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. It was not because the Roman emperor came and did what and what. It was from the people that claimed to serve God. They made at Christians. They made at Christ. They made at, they, they, they persecuted the church. He's saying these people hated and persecuted us from day one, yet you, Galatians, you are letting them in the church and allowing them to destroy you with their destructive heresies. The heresies of human achievement. The heresies of pride, where man tells himself, I can do it. But that's, that's simply because man overestimates his abilities and underestimates God's righteousness. He thinks God's righteousness is actually here, not there. It's actually here and he can attain to it. Brothers and sisters, these people are worshipping a wrong God. The God of scripture cannot be pleased by any of our good works. Isaiah said it, Jeremiah said it, Jesus said it. Our works, even our good works, they're like filthy rags. They cannot satisfy. That is why only Christ's work satisfies. And those who are in Christ are set free. Let's read uh, Revelation chapter 2. We're going to see what else is going on there. Because these false teachers did not give up. They continued attacking the church of Christ with this destructive heresies. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus himself steps in. He sends different messages to different churches. And we know that one of the churches was under attack by these guys because we're going to read in chapter 2 verse 8, listen to what Jesus there is saying. I mean, what the word of God is saying. He says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is first and last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
He's saying to them, these people who are slandering you, these people who are saying bad things about you, who are, who are provoking you, who are, who are offending and insulting you for my name, I know they try to claim that they are my people. But let me tell you, they are a synagogue of Satan. That's Jesus' mouth. That's him saying this to this church. And he, he, he's saying something else, Jesus. He says, verse 10, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Jesus is commanding them to this one thing. He says, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Brothers and sisters, Revelation was written at a time when a lot of the apostles were already gone. This is like towards... The, the, the end of the apostolic age. John was probably the only apostle alive at the time. But the legalists did not give up. They dealt with them in AD 49, when, the, when Acts chapter 15, where the, the, the first church council was held, they dealt with legalism. They sent a, an official letter to different Gentile churches to say, guys, you don't have to obey the Mosaic law to be our brothers. But these people never gave up. Brothers and sisters, the persecution of Ishmael and Isaac, uh, of Ishmael to Isaac, is still continuing. They hate the church. Jesus there says they will imprison you. They will not leave you alone. Obviously, there's more than just imprisonment that happened. Others were injured. Others were killed. We know how a persecution works. So as we are concluding this second point, Paul is saying to the Galatian church, wake up. This is not brotherhood. Don't be deceived. There's us and there's them. We are not one. They are the persecutors. We are the persecuted. But you have received them. How could you receive such people and give them a platform to teach you things that are contrary to what Christ has, has taught you through my preaching? Through the faithful preaching of the ministers I came with. And the ministers I left you with, because they planted churches and they established elders. But they quickly dropped the gospel and went to nonsense. These people are slaves and we are free. This is freedom. That's our second point. Let's go to our last point. The responsibility. We see this from verse 31, I mean, sorry, yeah, from verse 30 all the way to chapter 5, verse 1. Paul then says to them, but what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So basically, Paul is saying to them in summary that enslaved people and free people cannot coexist. If you don't believe Paul's argument, you can try it. You can visit prison one day, and you'll see what those prisoners will do to you. They hate you. <laughs> because you are free, and they are in prison. That one minute you're going to spend in there, they will show you alive. That is exactly what slavery does, and this slavery here comes wearing makeup. It comes looking nice. It comes with eloquence of speech. It comes with men that call themselves scholars of the Bible. It says, we are going to teach you where you didn't understand. Only that they are, they are actually dragging you into slavery, to be chained. Now, Scripture says, get rid of the old covenant of law and slavery because it will not result in the same inheritance of blessings and salvation like the new covenant of grace and freedom. That is basically what verse 30 means. Obviously, he's talking about what God had to say to Abraham to get rid of Hagar. Because now, Isaac is here, and God has a plan about what he's doing in this family. And Hagar and his son, they cannot remain here. And obviously, uh, the other verses tell us that the, the enmity between the two boys continued. But Isaac is not throwing any punches. It's Ishmael, always. He doesn't give up. So let's keep going. We who come to Christ by faith, we are the redeemed people of God. And Christ and Christ alone has set us free. We are not enslaved. We are not in chains. 
We are not slavery. We are not in slavery. We are not slaves. And Paul says we must have no room for this nonsense. Amongst us, in our heads, in our homes, in our church, in the church, in the body of Christ, there must be no room for the law. For people to, to, to put pressure on believers and say, you must pray like this, you must look like this, you must speak like this, you must come at this time and face there when you pray. And brothers and sisters, we are not called to that. Christ has called us to freedom. That is exactly what chapter 5 is saying. Verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So he's saying Christ has set us free. Somebody can ask, oh, Solvet, you've been talking about this freedom. What is it actually? What are we free from? Brothers and sisters, we are free from the demands and the curses of the law. That is exactly what we are free from. If you would divide the, 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 the law, you would have to, the law that was given to Israel, you would have to categorize it under three divisions. It was the moral law, it was the civil law, it was the ceremonial law. The moral law deals with do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not lie. That, that still applies today. God wants holiness out of our lives, brothers and sisters. But we do not become holy because we are obeying the law. The law is no longer a means nor an end to anything. Because in the new covenant, the, the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 16, verse 17, that God has written the law within our hearts. So when we become holy, when we do not steal, when we do not uh, commit adultery, when we do not lie to our brothers and sisters, it's not because we are trying to tick a box to end God's favor. It's because we love God. And we will obey him out of love. Those two four-year-old twin girls cannot say that about what, the way they feel when they obey their father. But we, in the new covenant, the law has been written in our hearts. And we are free to say out of love, I am sorry to a brother or sister in Christ. Out of love, we are free to say, uh, to serve you, to, to do good to you. Not because I'm trying to obey a law that said, uh, do not steal, but because I love the God that made my brother in Christ. And I love my brother in Christ because the law of God is in my heart and I love the law of God. Remember also what G, uh, the, the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. We can actually page there. Let's go. Let's open the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. I want you to see what the Apostle John is saying there. Which is another beautiful thing about those who are in the new covenant. The book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 3, it says, In fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. When we obey God in the new covenant, we are not like that man who is carrying this heavy weight and trying to climb this mountain and this weight is so heavy. This man has no joy. This man is just, is just complaining in his heart. Complaining against the very God he is trying to serve. When we obey the law of God, it's not burdensome to us. It's nice. It's, it's, it's a joy. It's a privilege. For me to go out of my way and to love my brother Hans is a privilege. It's not me taking a box because God has done a miraculous work of taking my heart of stone and throwing it away and giving me a heart of flesh. And I love his people and I love him. So obeying God is my joy. I don't see it as climbing this mountain. I don't see it as me trying to achieve anything that I don't have already through the death of Christ. I already have everything. Ephesians chapter 1, remember, it speaks of all these heavenly blessings that we have through Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are not free to sin. This freedom Christ has purchased for us is not freedom to continue living in sin and, and the bondage of that part. No! The freedom is for us to do what we were meant to do. 
All creatures are meant to live for the glory of who? Of God. But we couldn't do that because we were in chains held by other things. Christ's death set us free from those things so that we can freely do what we want to do because what we want to do is what we should do. And now we are free to do that to the glory of God. Amen. So in our freedom, brothers and sisters, we obey God and we live holy lives out of love for God because he called us in holiness. Remember 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. It says something like this. Be holy, for the God who called you is holy. We know that the moral law is not thrown away. Yes, it's thrown away in a sense of that being a means to get to God. But God still expects us to be moral, still expects us to be holy, still expects us to have this true Christ-likeness, which the Pharisees didn't have because they had only the outside appearance. But inside, they were nonsense. They were trash. They were, they were, they were sinners of, of note. But we, our hearts have been changed. We are free to be the same in public and to be the same in private. We have that freedom. We do not have that propensity for sin and the devil to hold us back to bondage. We can actually live true holy lives. Holy lives that God is pleased by. Not because we are holy in and of ourselves, but because he has given us that. And we are expressing it. When a Christian is obeying God, he's just expressing who he is. He's expressing the new creature that God has made in him. He's not expressing some type of a thing he's trying to become. So our love for God allows us to freely use even our spiritual gifts. If you are gifted in teaching, if you are gifted in preaching, if you are gifted in, in serving this way, if you are gifted in hospitality, Rob talked about it in the morning. If you are gifted in, 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 in loving strangers, in saving people who are in need, praying for others, use the gift for the glory of God. Not because you are trying to gain favors from God, but because God has made you what he made you and you are using what he has gifted you with to his glory. Out of love for God. Not out of fear that this tyrant God I'm worshipping might kill me if I don't. No. This doctrine doesn't belong in the church of Christ, brothers and sisters. We are free to serve God with our spiritual griefs, to serve one another without shame, without worrying about what will Luke say when I'm imperfect. Because this is not, this is not that club where people are judgmental, like what the law would cause. Because the law would only produce slaves that want other people, where, where, where everyone wants other people around him to continue being enslaved, and he's keeping an eye on that. You are being micromanaged by this one, and you are micromanaging this one, and this one is, it's a mess. Nobody loves anyone. Everybody's always feeling guilty because this is exactly what it's about, slavery. This is a place, brothers and sisters, where God has called us to be his children, we are in the heavenly Jerusalem. We are in the religion that comes from heaven. We serve God without fear, without pressure, but with a passion and a joy in our hearts. So, I encourage you, whatever the Lord has been allowing you and gifting you to serve, keep doing that. Do more. Keep throwing yourself to the service of this great God who has rescued you. Not because you are trying to gain anything, but because you are, you are his child. You are joyful in the person you have become because of his grace. This is our freedom. Not free to live in sin. Not free to live to serve worldly standards that nobody knows when they come, where they come from. Not free to live according to legalists who have misinterpreted the Old Testament laws and are trying to make us live under them but we are free to love God and serve him. So, Paul only has one last thing to say to them, which is in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, stand firm, therefore. Stand firm. It is your responsibility to stay where Christ has faithfully put you. Do not let yourself to slide according to some other wave that's going to blow onto you. You have a responsibility to stand firm. 
And that is exactly what Jesus said. If you remember what we just read in, in the book of Revelation to that church in Smyrna, he said they're about to throw some of you in, people, in prison. Stay faithful. Remain faithful. What you have is gold. Don't let it, don't let it be taken away. What you have is more precious than gold. What you have will outlast this life. That is why he says, I will give you a victor's crown of life. Because what I'm calling you to stand on is not futile. It's not in vain. You are the children of my father. That's what Jesus is saying. You have been born into the kingdom of heaven. And there is no one who can steal what you truly are. So stand firm in what you truly are. Be the free, liberated Christians of uh, children of God. And I'm going to take us to one last verse as we close this. Let's open 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And this, brothers and sisters, is exactly the principle that should guide your life, according to everything we've already said. So if you have found 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it reads like this. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Remember those three types of laws I mentioned, the moral law, the civil laws of who you can talk to, who you can marry, how to deal with disputes, who does what, what you can eat, what you can drink, and the, the ceremonial laws about who is unclean, who shouldn't walk into the presence of God, who cannot fellowship in this way because they have been doing this or that, and they must go and pay for their sins by killing this cow, and this is how to kill it. If you kill it this way, you're still a sinner. All those laws, Christ has fulfilled them for us. What we do when we serve God, we're not trying to obey the law. We are doing what he's saying here when he says, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, so whatever can mean whether you're at work, whether you're in your house, whether you're raising your, kill, your, your children, whether you're serving in the church on music, or you're, you're, you're operating the screen, or you're making tea, or even sitting there listening to the word of God being preached. Everything you do, out there and in there, in your private room, alone in darkness where nobody sees you, do everything to the glory of God. That is the new covenant. That is where the Galatians belong. That is where Paul himself belong. That is where we, as Benoni Bible Church, belong. And Paul is saying, you who want to be under the law, don't you know that it's all slavery? Don't you know that we have been called into this beautiful, precious kingdom of such freedom, of such amazing way to relate with God? So brothers and sisters, let's stand firm in our freedom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. You are such an amazing God. We thank you that you are so faithful that you have come down to this earth to live a perfect life, to die the, the death, the cruel death on the cross, to be buried and to rise, to rise up on the third day, and also, Lord, to, be, to ascend to heaven and to continue interceding for us all so that we can be saved, all so that we can be acceptable before the Lord, God the, God, God the Father, without having to obey any law, but to love God with all of our hearts, with all of our strength, and with all of our, with all of our minds, and to love one another as, as we love ourselves. That is the law you gave us, dear Lord, and you have enabled us by the power of your Spirit when the people in the, in the, in the law of slavery feel, feel unworthy, when they say, I am unclean, I cannot go to God, you, dear Lord, have made us righteous by the death on the cross. And you, dear Lord, have moved in and live within us. We can never be unclean. You have already decided to move in, and you will never move out. Dear Lord, this is the seal of the Holy Spirit we are sealed with, all the way until the day of redemption. Remind us of this truth you taught us this day, Lord. Help us to stand firm. Help us, O oh God, to reject any doctrine that will pull us back into slavery. 
Help us to not be judgmental of one another. Help us to not be judging and, 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 and fearful and, and, and loveless and narcissistic towards one another. Help us, Lord, to be free and let others around us to be free in their service of the Lord, knowing that we all are one body of Christ. Remind us even of the beautiful truth we had in the previous weekend when we had a conference where we were, we were told how the Holy Spirit gels us together as a body of Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, to not be this legalistic people. Help us to not fall victim to these doctrines of this world. Some of the legalistic things coming from our own personal cultural backgrounds we come from. Help us, free us from that, dear Lord, and give us strength and encouragement to stay within the freedom you give us. We thank you, O oh God, for this. We pray that you continue working in our hearts, continue teaching us your word, continue helping us, Lord, to love and serve you and to do anything we do to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.